Welcome back. This is our 24th show in a series of shows entitled Rehabilitation Coming Soon, where we have been discussing the mass incarceration practices of the United States and those effect of those practices on the state of Hawaii. I am Aaron Wills. I'm a William S. Richardson Law School graduate and a research consultant for Abigail Kwananakoa's Research Center. I am also a paralegal for retired Judge Mike Towns' private mediation practice. Over the past four months, um, we have heard from numerous professionals in the community who are willing to discuss the criminal justice system and see the problem of mass incarceration from different perspectives. Today, we'd like to hear the perspective from a public health educator and a restorative justice lawyer, lawyer Lauren Walker. Um, welcome and thank you for coming on our show, Lauren. Thank you. Um, a little bit background on our guest. Uh, Lauren, for the past 20 years, she has been developing talking circles and studying them to address crime, trauma, and injustice. She directs the Hawaii Friends of Restorative Justice at www.hawaiifriends.org and is a senior Fulbright specialist sponsored by the U.S. State Department to, provi to provide restorative justice training internationally. She reviews articles for five academic journals and has authored over 60 publications. She has visited prisons throughout the world and has received national awards for her work in restorative justice and solution-focused approaches. Her website is www.laurenwalker, which is L-O-R-E-N-N-W-A-L-K-E-R.com. Welcome, Lauren, and thank you for taking the time to come on the show. Thanks. Well, let's just, um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about restorative justice today. So let's start out with just talking about um, what led you to start doing your current work. Okay. Uh, actually, I learned about restorative justice when I was studying for my public health degree after I had been a practicing attorney for about 10 years. And as I was studying for the degree, I was also doing cases. I'd come from being a deputy attorney general doing just regular civil litigation for the state of Hawaii. And I actually had a lot of cases where I defended uh, prison guards in the state of Hawaii in um, lawsuits that had to do with the prisons, foster care, that kind of stuff. And um, after I quit doing that, I started getting the master's degree in public health, and I was taking cases from the family court mm -hmm. to um, represent indigent people, indigent children, and uh, adults who were charged with crimes and also uh, neglect of children, you know, parent cases. And um, Judge Town actually was the senior judge then. Okay. And um, I was in public health. We learn about group process mm -hmm. and about how that's the way to change people's behaviors is to get them to want to do that and to talk about it, talk about their values and, you know, motivation, stuff like that. And Judge Town, because I was talking also, you know, I was in court and these things were happening in court um, that were odd. Uh, Judge Town said, um, you know, Lauren, you should get into restorative justice. And that's how I first heard those two words was oh, Michael Town. Okay. So, and that was uh, over 20 years ago now. <laughs> well, he's been, you know, he's been championing that cause for a while. I know we talked a little bit before, um, before the show about this. What is restorative justice? Well, restorative justice, there is restorative justice philosophy, okay. and there is something else called restorative practices. Okay. And this is like a new field that started in the 70s, but it goes, it has ancient roots to indigenous people's uh, practices for okay. reconciliation and um, conflict resolution. And it's, um, the restorative philosophy is basically that justice should be about healing. Justice isn't just retribution, punishment, yeah. and um, being angry at someone for bad behavior. Right. It is restorative justice is that, that justice should really be about healing and it should include the people who were hurt and we should honor them and have autonomy, they should have autonomy and have a place at the table. So instead of a restorative, so then we get to restorative practices mm -hmm. which apply this philosophy of restorative justice. And um, basically, the, the, and there's no, no one agrees on any of this stuff, hardly. You know, it's all, it's like justice. What does justice mean? Everyone group argues right. about it. And with restorative justice, too, people don't agree on it. But the, the person th that I follow is a man named Howard Zare, who is, he is probably one of, he is the most, one of the, in the United States, he's definitely the most um, renowned restorative justice person. And um, he started this very early, getting into this restorative justice work and the way Howard describes it really fits with my background in public health 
which is that restorative justice is, uh, restorative practices are a set of questions that when there is a wrongdoing, and that's another thing too, it's about wrongdoing, when there is a wrongdoing. So it's not just really when people are in a dispute and I'm arguing with you about, uh, you're playing your music too loud, mm -hmm. I'm trying to go to sleep. This is a dispute we have. So um, restorative justice really is about where uh, you were playing your music too loud and I came over and I took the um, iPad and threw it at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so then now there's a wrongdoing. And so we're going to use a restorative practice to uh, deal with this. Mm -hmm. And I want to do it. I'm taking responsibility. I recognize my role and what happened. And, um, and then there's a set of questions in there. Who was harmed? Who was harmed by what I did? Right. Uh, how were they harmed? Whose obligation is it to fix this? And um, what do you need for me to do to repair the harm? Right. So it would be stuff like, you know, if your eye got cut, you know, maybe you need, you know, help to get to the hospital and, you know, me to pay your bills, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Take care, take your dog for a walk. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Judge Town always brings up this point when he talks about restorative justice. He says the key is making the victim whole again. Uh, trying to. We're trying you, to. Right. You can't, it's right, like a cut. True. Um, a crime and wrongdoing, especially a crime when you've been, and I personally too, that's how also I got into this work was I was the victim of a very serious uh, attempted murder and um, attempted rape and an assault that mm -hmm. left me. I was in the hospital and had to have plastic surgery and um, it was really really scary, huge event. Actually, it changed my life for the good because I ended up going to law school oh. and I'm going to college even. I didn't, I wasn't even in a college um, graduate, I mean a high school graduate, so oh, I, um, so it was, it ended up being a good thing for me, I mean not a good thing, but you know, I made something good out of it. But anyway, it, um, it's really a serious violation and it's like when you're really seriously violated, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying like every single thing is a serious violation, but when you are, it's like a, it's like a wound. And so, um, you know, you can heal a wound, but you will always have a scar. You know, you have a scar, and hopefully, um, people can make something out of the scar positive. You know, like tougher skin, and like in my case, when I was almost murdered, it, it did. It 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 ha led to positive results for me. Well, that's good. Um, so let's talk about kind of the restorative justice project that you're working on and have developed and stuff. Okay. Well, right now we've done a lot okay. in the last 20 years. We have done a lot. We have done actually. I think we've done more than almost any other organ. I don't know anybody else who's done as much as we have done the okay. Hawaii Friends of Restorative Justice and uh, we've done stuff in public housing with schools with the police department with the courts we have a project right now with federal court we've done stuff with state court um, but our big project we've been working on for 10 years now is a re-entry planning process for people who are in prison okay and we've done uh, about 140 of these uh, we call them circles hui kahi circles okay. means a group and individual coming together and um, they make a plan and they, they, it's a restorative process and we've done a lot of research and we've had 600 people participate in these circles. So the circle takes place in the prison, the person applies for it. It's only for people who do want to take responsibility for, um, for any wrongdoing that they did and, and, and how their incarceration affected their family. So um, we have actually had two cases, one here in Hawaii that uh, was written about and it's in a published paper, paper that was recently published, um, about a woman who was innocent, who had one of these. And um, she was able to, she was able to, to talk about her, um, her injustice and also she felt like she had treated her children badly. Mm. She was a teenager, had a lot of problems, but um, okay. so this reentry program is really big. We've done a bunch of research. Children who have participated in them, in the circles, find that they have experienced healing. They've been able to cope with traumatic events. Okay. So they've had, they've become more optimistic after they've had a circle and um, yeah, it's, they, it's been very, and they've had less rumination, which is the psychology word for thinking about the event over and over again. You know, they've been able to let go of these, uh, the hardship of losing a parent to prison. So, and then we just did research too on recidivism, and mm -hmm. we do have a significant, um, 
we have significantly less repeat crime for people who have these circles. I'm mm -hmm. not saying that they totally changed somebody, you know, but we looked, we did a very good study with Janet Davidson at Chaminade uh, Independent Evaluation, and there is a, um, we do have, uh, the people who have these circles compared to people who wanted a circle but didn't get one, because we didn't, mm -hmm. we don't, we're not funded hardly, and then um, compared to the state's rate, three years after leaving prison, the people who had these reentry circles do have less recidivism. Well, that's exactly what we're trying to uh, reduce is the right. recidivism rate. Yeah, here. So, yeah exactly. Um, there's a lot of uh, issues that come up because the recidivism rate is so high. Mm -hmm. um, we had Senator Willis Barrow on the show, mm -hmm. and he was talking about um, well, what he suggests is is what's called a re-entry program, a re-entry mm -hmm. center. He wants to mm -hmm. build a re-entry center where people, mm -hmm. you know, they can build up the skills as you're about to go out into the community mm -hmm. again, um, better employment, you know, mm -hmm. employable people. Um, but he was off of the boat of building new prison, like, and he doesn't want to do it at all. Oh, me neither. Uh, and, and well, it's interesting you bring that up because mm -hmm. most of our shows we kind of just want to ask you know people mm -hmm. why why do you feel that way just because given O Triple C is born you know is made 1913-16 the mm -hmm. place is dilapidated mm -hmm. um, we had an attorney oh Jack Tanaki on here who said mm -hmm. that the conditions in O Triple C right mm -hmm. now are at crisis level mm -hmm. so what do we do well we've got too many people in our Hawaii prisons yeah. We have, uh, according to Kat Brady, who is an yeah, expert have, in on the show too. statistics too, 74% um, of the people in the Hawaii State Prisons, and we have about 6,000 people, 74% are Class C felons. Oh, okay, yeah. Who have done things like uh, violated parole, and the stuff for like parole violation is like, I said I was working 40 hours, but I was really only working 28 or 30, mm -hmm. um, I moved and didn't tell you. Mm -hmm. um, other residual, that you find a pipe with some residual drug on it. You mm -hmm. know, these crimes, we, we don't need all these people in prison. When I first started working in the Hawaii prisons, I was in college at UH. And uh, I worked at the women's prison uh, under Olamana, which is now the children's prison. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was only like 20 women. I knew all their names in the whole state, that's all there was. I mean, on the Outer Islands, there was probably some people too, but um, today there's like, across the street now is where the women's yeah. prison is, where we're doing projects, and there's like 250 people, 300 people in there. So we have too many people in prison. And the state of Hawaii right now, I have not heard any plan for decreasing prison population, which is what we need to do. Yeah. We need to do more of this re-entry. I like the idea of a re-entry center. Mm -hmm. We need to do more of these talking circles mm -hmm. to help people reestablish bonds and relationships yeah. that they have uh, that have been hurt and um, bring healing to the families uh, something that is really that uh, your listeners might be interested in knowing is that there is this uh, one of the most accepted concepts in criminology it's called the victim offender overlap and that is where people who are victimized sometimes unfortunately because they have been treated so unjustly, they turn to to bad behavior mm -hmm. and become offenders. And we have, I would love for everyone to know, the people that I know in the the, the prisons, these people, the, the, their life stories, yeah. it's astounding. Yeah. You would be people, I brought people in who have experience working with, you know, child welfare for years and lawyers and guardian ad litems, and they're just blown away by the, the level of trauma that people have suffered who are in prison. So we need to stop that. We need to bring healing. And I think restorative justice can do that. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, rehabilitation is something we've been driving, you know, hard for this show because, you know, another um, thing that uh, Kat Brady brought up was the amount of, uh, you know, simple drug users we have in and that rehabilitation really comes down to them getting the help that they need and there's not enough programs. There's just not enough out there. And so they sit mm -hmm. and they either get worse or they don't get the help. So, okay, well, we, we will be right back with Lauren Walker. My name is Aaron Wills, and this is Rehabilitation Coming Soon. Hi, I'm Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist here in Hawaii, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, which is on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock. Have a great summit. Take care of your mental health. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi, and you can catch me on Mondays at 11 on Think Tech Hawaii. Stacy to the rescue. See you.
see you then. Aloha, everybody. My name is Mark Shklov. I'd like you to join me for my program, Law Across the Sea, on thinktechhawaii.com. Aloha. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Welcome back. I'm Aaron Wills. This is Rehabilitation Coming Soon, and we are sitting here with our guest, Lauren Walker. Okay, Lauren, well, let's um, talk a little bit. How does you know, you, you mentioned it a little bit, but how does restorative justice help people heal and rehabilitate? I mean, how, how does your program actually work out those details? Mm -hmm. Well, people feel really uncomfortable. Like in my case, I'll just talk about my case. Okay. When I got um, assaulted and went through this really horrendous um, event, my, my friends didn't talk about it a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, my family didn't talk, people didn't talk about it. And it's really funny because years later, um, one of my other friends had heard a rumor and um, I had a daughter. When it happened, I was a single parent. And for some reason, he thought that my daughter was the, the child of uh, the rape. And you know what I mean? It was like there was no discussion mm -hmm. about it. So being able to talk about it to, uh, is really important for people who want to do it. People right. who don't want to, I'm not saying ever, to never force anybody. Right, right. But giving people an opportunity and most people, most people over half really want to have some kind of discussion. So I think talking about it and processing and having the opportunity to, to have your emotions out. A lot of times people um, think, uh, like, I don't know if you've ever done, I don't if it's, if it's ever happened to you, but when you feel something and someone will say, oh, we shouldn't feel like that. Well, a restorative justice process never is like that. It's mm -hmm. always, everyone is hugely respected. And however you feel is, that is respected. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important for people to have that opportunity. I think Americans, especially, um, we don't have a lot of emotional intelligence training. And, <laughs> you know, we don't talk about, like little kids at school, your friend doesn't like you. You know, we don't, it's just like, well, you know, uh, you should share that, Erin, share your truck with her. You know, it's like, Let's just talk about he doesn't like me, you know? Right, right. Let's let's talk about this. You right. know how I feel okay, you know? We don't always get what we want. Yeah. So, yeah. I think having the discussion, the dialogue, the talking circle is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 especially when a traumatic event has happened. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I'm glad that you brought up your own story. I was when I was 19 years old, I was stabbed in the face and the chest oh. and you can kind of see the scar oh, wow. on my face right there. Uh -huh. wow. And um it was a fight and it was, you know, we were kind of at a party and we got, me and my friend got cornered in a kitchen and so we had to fight our way out of it. Wow. And as I was walking home, and I didn't even know because I was uh -huh. so drunk, my friend was like, man, you, you, you got, you're really injured. Wow. And I, I was like, I am. And so I saw my reflection in the mirror and I got home uh -huh. and there was my, my cheek was hanging off. I could see all my teeth. I got stabbed in the chest too and then I started freaking out. And it was four uh -huh. hours of surgery, staples. Wow. At that time, I was a full ride scholarship athlete at University of Nebraska on the football team. Oh, wow. And we were defending national champions. Uh -huh. So I went down there and I'm zipper faced. I have 44 stitches here, four staples in my chest. Uh -huh. And you know, just the, the, the look that I got was just terrified. They were terrified yeah. of me. Yeah. Um, my coaches were like, you got some rough friends. You, you got some scary friends. I'm like, hey, my friend did not do this to me. You know, yeah. friends don't stab you in the right. face. But I never talked about it. Yeah. I didn't talk about it for four years because yeah. I had to get out of there. And once I got out of, you know, school, uh -huh. you know, I had one incident where I actually could sit down and talk about it. And, uh -huh. you know, it's, it's amazing what happens when you can talk about the things that really affect someone, you know, personally and deeply and, and personally. Absolutely. So, and a lot of these people who are in jail never get that mm -hmm. opportunity because what happens is they go through the process of this right. criminalization process. They end up behind bars. They become the bad ones. Right. And then they mm -hmm. want to tell everybody mm -hmm. how they ended up there. No one mm -hmm. wants to listen. No. No. So I'm glad that you, ha you these circles are actually giving them an opportunity to, you know, kind of open up and heal because mm -hmm. that's what mm -hmm. the whole point is. Right. Um, right. How can restorative justice help prevent crime? Well, I think by the healing because, see, people are oh, also, okay, so victims feel they can have healing from right. it. And then the other piece is that the person who did the wrongdoing, they hear the person face to face. It's not a judge looking down at them, telling them, how come you did this? And, 
you know, you're bad and everyone's mad at him or her. And uh, instead they can hear someone. They're not, um, that's what I noticed in family court when I first got into this stuff, was little kids were like, because they were getting in trouble all the time, they became very self-absorbed. Everything was about me, protecting me, you know, and I'd be like, I'm a parent of three kids, you know, I'd be asking my clients, you know, dude, look what you did to that lady over there, do you want to say, they'd be like, Lauren, you don't know what it's like for me. And they just didn't have room mm -hmm. to, because they were so afraid, and that's part of the problem with our current criminal justice system because it's so punitive, people yeah. don't have space, they don't have room to ha develop empathy yeah. because they're so protecting themselves, you know? Yeah. And so, so that's a great thing, it, it helps people. And there's been research on this, brain research with psychopaths, that it has increased empathy. Mm. Mm. Well, as far as, you know, the Hawaii prison system, and we talked about this, you know, with a re-entry center. What, what are some other ideas that maybe that you're working on or that you have that the Hawaii prison system could do to increase the rehabilitation aspect of the prison system? Well, first of all, they could have a plan <laughs> for decreasing right. the prison population right. instead of just a plan and putting like $16 million into planning the Maui prison. Yeah. You know, that money could have been put into rehabilitation for people, yeah. please. And um, so they could have a plan for reducing prison population and and, and using these restorative practices and, and um, doing more work furlough. Do, you know, and if yeah. we, all the money we're taking to build the new prison, which I understand from the state legislature from a, a resolution is gonna be one and a half to two billion yeah. dollars, mm -hmm. um, that money could go into rehabilitation. You know, it's not a panacea. Restorative justice is not a panacea. It's not gonna fix everybody. There's gonna be somebody who has this and who goes out, we've already had people do bad stuff again. It's not gonna be a cure-all. Right, you know, right. there's gonna be people who mess up on parole and yeah. whatever, but we can't just give up. We can't throw the baby out with the bathtub or whatever that saying is. Right, right, right. You know, we gotta keep trying and giving people the opportunity to learn and um, get better. And we can't keep these class C felons, 75% of them imprisoned that money could be used for rehabilitation. Did, have you talked to Bob Merce at all about his trip to Norway? Yes, I have. And I've been to Norway. I've been to um, Halden Prison okay. myself some years ago. I've been to prisons actually all over the world. And um, I even stayed in a prison in Brazil. I slept in one. Okay. My husband enjoyed that. <laughs> and um, it was a restorative prison. It was okay. a fat, amazing experience. Well, what is your feelings about the, the prison system in Norway? Because oh, it's, it's way better. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is very better. <laughs> they encourage relationship with the jailer and the person who is in prison. Right. People don't wear uniforms. They wear yeah. street clothes. They're treated humanely. Yeah. They're not just a number. And it's not like a, a metal building with a no. Box, it's very no. Bars. It is. They have. They do have like television. A, a they room, have flat screen TV. Right? Yeah, yes. I seen it. I, yeah, I was yeah. impressed, and and I know it's such a radical jump from where uh -huh. we're at. Oh, we're actually. You know, I'll tell you honestly. And I visited prisons all over the okay. the world except Africa and Australia, and um, uh, our Hawaii state prisons are only worse than Indonesian ones that I've seen so far. The Indonesia, but Hawaii state prisons are really bad compared to Italy, Spain, Brazil, the Brazilian okay. one I saw. I mean, the state prison in Brazil is probably more like Hawaii state prisons. You know, I didn't, I saw it a little bit. It's probably more like Hawaii state prisons, but the, the one I saw was a, uh, it was a, a faith-based um, restorative prison. How does Hawaii like compare to other pr states pr in the states? Well, um, I haven't visited a lot of other states. California, I've seen a little bit, and um, but I do compare it to the federal system. Okay. I've seen the Hawaii. I mean, the federal system, yeah. which is a lot, a lot yeah, better. Yeah, it is so much better. Yeah, yeah they just put a lot more. Um, professionalism into the people who work there. Yeah. They get really good training. Mm -hmm. There's a lot more support for rehabilitation, I think. Yeah. Um, it's just completely different. They have educational programs, higher education. You know, it's not like ours, what we do. Is no, I agree. I agree. Um, well, let's talk quickly before we end here. What could okay. the Hawaii public schools do to start helping prevent crime? Um, okay, they could start having less zero tolerance, okay. Oh, okay. less three strikes, more uh, opportunities to learn when um, Aaron is hurt. 
you know, we can bring in the people who uh, hurt him and have these talking circles. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take a lot of money. There is no need for hundreds of thousands of dollars to start these restorative programs. Mm -hmm. We have been willing and have contacted the DOE in the past. Pat Hamamoto, the former superintendent, was kind of, we almost had her interested and then she left. But, um, you know, we're always open to helping any school that wants to start a restorative program. It doesn't take a lot. Okay, and so what about individuals? I mean, if they're going to apply restorative justice in their daily lives, how, how would someone go about doing that if there's some kind of principles that they can follow? Okay, well, um, the first thing I think is um, to, to have respect for someone who, if, who's someone who's been hurt, mm -hmm. to have respect for them. And if they're talking about their feelings, don't jump in and say, oh, you shouldn't feel like that. Right. You know, don't ever say that. Right, right. Let someone, let them, let them feel how they feel. Right. And um, don't ask why so much. Like, well, why do you feel like that? Why did that, you know, we're so like, want to know why. It's like, you know what? People don't know why. Yeah, you right. know, I don't know why. The guy who hit you, he probably, I don't know why I was drunk, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> why is not so important. But what is important is, what are we going to do about this? What can we do to help Aaron? Or what can we do to help Lauren when she got attacked? Right, right, right. You know, what can we do to help things? What can we do to make things better? So look at it like that. So if you're a parent, and all of us have some kind of relationship usually with kids, we can do that when kids do, and kids naturally do wrong things, okay? That's another thing the schools yeah. can admit and see. Kids are gonna do wrong things, children are gonna misbehave, teenagers especially, and teenagers have the highest rate of rehabilitation, mm. even from the most serious crimes that they commit. Mm. They have the highest rate of rehabilitation, and all of us have done stuff. I don't know any adult that never did anything wrong as a child, yeah. you know, and as a teenager. So, so have a little bit more respect and, um, and ask what we can do to make things right. And, and I, I believe in that. I mean, you know, as far as the rehabilitation, as far as teenagers go, mm -hmm. I was, I mean, I wasn't an easy teenager. And Me I neither. got there around about 15 or 16. I kind of, you know, my mom was constantly, she had me in swimming since I was like six years old. So oh. I was a competitive swimmer my oh, whole wow. life. I ended up, so yeah. this is, the, the long story short is this. When I was 14, 15, I told my mom, I don't want to swim no more. Uh -huh. She's like, okay, well then you're going to get a job. Uh -huh. And so she took me down to an old folks home uh -huh. and I had to apply and I got the job and oh. they put me in the kitchen. Great. And so I had to serve food and then clean up after them. Uh -huh. And then it was the worst job, of course, <laughs> ever. And after about a month of doing that, I came home, okay, I'm, I'm going to go back to swimming. I'll swim. I'll do whatever you want me to do. And I ended up winning state, being a uh, team captain, got wow. a bunch of scholarship offers. Nice. But then I played football and then uh -huh. I got a, a scholarship offer that I accepted for that. Uh -huh. So. You know, it, teenagers can go down so many different paths. Yes, yeah. And, and you know, I don't have a teenager yet. My son right. is ten, but he's getting uh, there. And yeah. you know, you have and, it to look forward to. Yes. <laughs> and what you have to mean, the main thing you have to do is you have to listen. You yes. know, my dad. I think one of the main criticisms I have of him, among many, was that he just wasn't a very good listener. Yeah. You know, he was a hard um, 1950s kind of attitude. Mm. I bring home the bacon. I want to come home. Don't bother me. Mm. You know, you know, mm. you cook the dinner and kind of stuff. Mm. Um, pick up after me. Yeah. And I, I just, I don't want to be like that. Yeah. I want to listen. Good. I want to listen to my kids. And right. I think it starts with your own attitude. So if you have the attitude that you want to listen, uh -huh. you will stop and listen to everything your kid tells you. Yeah. And so my son and I have a really close relationship. He was kind of giving me the heat this morning because uh -huh. I went to the gym late last night. He's like, you're going to take me to the gym tonight, aren't you, Dad? And so... <laughs> You know, nice. so it's just being able to listen to what they're telling you and yes. to really respond to it. Yeah. And I think that's what you can do to be a good parent and a good yes. individual. And nothing is permanent. Your feelings are never permanent. As a parent, if you worry about your children, you know, d you know just hang in there. And nothing is permanent. That's right. And stay optimistic. Yep. You know, just stay optimistic. And keep your faith. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for helping, uh, helping us with this show and talk about this subject. And, um, <clears throat> help us continue to help us to continue to keep this discussion going by until another show of rehabilitation coming soon. We hope to continue our discussion of the criminal justice system and the fact the effect of mass incarceration on the state of Hawaii very soon. So stay tuned. Coming up next is Sustainable Hawaii with Kirsten Turner. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that was nice, Darren. My son.